For more on Ukraine and the day's top political stories, let's bring in Weijia Zhang and Nicole Killian. Weijia is CBS News' senior White House correspondent. Nicole is a CBS News congressional correspondent. So, Weijia, what is the president aiming to do to keep this funding going to Ukraine? Well, Scott, last week, President Biden was very blunt when he said that he had exhausted his drawdown authority with regard to security assistance. $3.5 billion was approved for this fiscal year. And when you crunch the numbers, it's very clear that that money is running out. And so he said he plans to send a supplemental budget to Congress in order to make sure there is no gap. Uh, between, um, you know, when they are sending ammunition, weapons, any kind of military assistance to Ukraine, as he hopes to do, pointing out that, you know, they do believe this is going to be a prolonged effort. However, today, even though several reporters tried to press White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki for a figure and for a status update to that official ask, um, she said they don't have those numbers yet, and she didn't have anything to share. Um, as far as how much money he'll ask for and when that might happen. So, um, you know, again, this is really significant because he has announced so much aid uh, that they are running out. And I did ask Jen Psaki, too, more broadly speaking, whether there was a cap to military assistance that the U.S. was willing and able to provide Ukraine. And she said she was certainly not ready to talk about any kind of cap now, but she did acknowledge that they wanted to front load all of that assistance um, which they did to make sure that Ukraine and the military had everything that it need, needed to really establish a strong defense against Russia. So at this point, we don't have any clarity in terms of what else the president plans to ask Congress for. Well, we did get an announcement from the president about the nomination of Bridget Brink to be the next ambassador to Ukraine. Will you tell us who she is and what this might mean for the possibility of reestablishing an embassy there? Right. So this is an, a question that we have been pressing the Biden administration really for months and months, if not longer, because that vacancy for a permanent position has been open since the beginning of the Biden administration, including for all these months that Russia has invaded Ukraine. And so now we know that he has nominated Ambassador Brink, who is currently serving as the ambassador to Slovakia. And we do expect that she will get a lot of bipartisan support. We don't anticipate any challenges to her Senate confirmation because um, she was confirmed under President Trump, who appointed her uh, to be the ambassador of Slovakia. So she brings a wealth of experience. She is a career foreign service officer. She's had assignments in the region before. And, you know, this is significant as the U.S. also announced um, that they were trying to reestablish, reopen the embassy in Kyiv as soon as possible. Um, I think, you know, Secretary Blinken himself said that they would be sending uh, U.S. diplomats to Lviv uh, nearby sometime next week with the hope of reopening that embassy as soon as possible in Kyiv, because obviously, um, you know, they feel it is very important to have those um, staff on the ground to be able to communicate with Ukrainian people, to bring the messages directly back to the U.S. However, they also acknowledge that there are security risks. And so that's why, you know, they are taking this also step by step. And we know members of Congress tell us they're getting questions back home about what they're doing on this issue as well. So, Nicole, let me shift it to the Capitol. How is Congress tackling this possibility of additional military assistance to Ukraine, in addition to what the White House has already announced? Yeah, well, as you mentioned, and as we've mentioned, you know, the right now lawmakers are waiting on that ask from the administration for additional aid. Lawmakers stand ready to approve a supplemental package uh, once they get that. And the ex expectation from at least some of the lawmakers that I've been talking to is that they do hope uh, that they will get some type of figure or request from the administration this week. And so that really is kind of the next step in the process here to continue that aid uh, that has been going to Ukraine, uh, whether it is to assist with military uh, aid 
aid, whether it is for humanitarian assistance. Uh, ultimately, again, we don't know what this next package will encompass, but again, the expectation is that uh, that will be a priority. That is something that uh, both Speaker Pelosi has said, you know, they will try to bring up a supplemental package as soon as possible. And Leader Schumer, just this afternoon on the floor, said approving aid is really critical and a priority for uh, this Congress as soon as they get that request. Uh, another thing, uh, though, to watch is whether or not some of this aid gets tied to other funding. You know, the administration also wants more money to deal with the ongoing pandemic. And uh, we saw just before the recess, for instance, uh, that Congress was not able to approve that funding because it got hung up over issues of immigration unrelated, uh, you know, based on this uh, Title 42 provision that the administration is seeking to end, although many lawmakers want to keep that in place. So it's possible we could see a replay of that kind of debate if for some reason this COVID funding is tied to Ukraine funding. You know, there are different schools of thought here as to whether or not that should happen or things should be kept separate. Uh, but again, uh, when it comes to this Ukraine funding, uh, many lawmakers say it's a priority. Also worth noting, uh, as far as the military aid is concerned, we do expect, at least in the House this week, to also uh, move forward with uh, what's called a Lend-Lease Act. And that is something that passed in the Senate before the recess. But basically, it would revive a World War II program to kind of cut through some of the red tape and expedite getting some of this military equipment to Ukraine. Well, Nicole, we spent a lot of this day trying to confirm the 2,300 plus text messages initially obtained by CNN that are to and from Mark Meadows around January 6, 2021. What more are you learning about who the former president's chief of staff was communicating with and about what they were communicating? Yeah, that's right. Well, this is quite the trove of text messages uh, that have been uh, obtained. And, you know, CBS News has been able to confirm some of these messages, including communications between uh, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene and uh, former White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows, in which in one exchange in particular, uh, Congresswoman Greene says that some uh, members of Congress uh, were talking and, and privately felt uh, that perhaps uh, former President Trump should have invoked martial law. Uh, following January 6th, although that is something she said she couldn't recall when she was uh, asked about that during a hearing about uh, her own <laughs> um, candidacy and, and being on the ballot in Georgia at a court hearing uh, late last week. Uh, but look, uh, this uh, trove of messages really kind of shows the extent and, and the pressure, quite frankly, that the former chief of staff may have been under uh, in terms of these various, uh, you know, schemes to try to overturn the election in terms of on the actual day of January 6th, the type of pressure that he was under from some members of uh, the president's own family to members of Congress to try to urge the former president to call off the rioters on January 6th. So uh, these messages, you know, there were also communications, for instance, with a number of journalists as well, uh, including some Fox News personalities like Sean Hannity. Some of those text messages have previously been revealed, uh, but some new ones uh, as part of this trove uh, include, for instance, communications on election day uh, where uh, you know there's this exchange between Mark Meadows and uh, Fox News host Sean Hannity uh, with Meadows trying to push Hannity to try to encourage people to get out the vote and get out to vote, I should say, uh, particularly in states uh, where uh, the Trump campaign at that time was vulnerable. So, uh, you know, a lot to cull through. I'm sure there's more we'll learn about these messages in the days to come. Nicole, what do these messages tell you about the status of the investigation by the committee? Well, quite frankly, what it tells me is that they really want to talk to Mark Meadows. I mean, look, we know the committee has already voted to hold him in contempt, and that is a process that is now playing out uh, in the Justice Department as they weigh uh, whether or not to move forward with uh, charges uh, or some type of indictment. Uh, but look, in the case of uh, Mark Meadows, I mean, I think the committee has made clear that they do see him as a key figure in all of this, and we can tell by the fact of these 2,000-plus messages from all sorts of individuals uh, uh, that uh, really he remains uh, a person of interest to this committee. I think it's also worth noting, as you're very well familiar, you know, the committee did uh, issue a court filing uh, summary judgment motion uh, late Friday uh, in which they basically said, look, uh, you know, because we have talked to so many witnesses so far, we want to narrow down our subpoena request for Mark Meadows. And we believe that there are some things that he can talk to us about. We believe there are at least seven areas that he 
can discuss with the committee without violating any kind of executive privilege claims, for instance, like these text messages, for instance, some of his communications with members of Congress, uh, some of his uh, involvement and communications over these fake elector schemes and what he may have known about efforts to try to replace the uh, former acting attorney general. So there's a really a lot of information that they want to glean from Mark Meadows. And I think this is yet another attempt to try to, you know, compel him to maybe uh, reverse course and come forward. Meanwhile, President Biden is keeping an eye on the politics of Congress. Ouija gave his first midterm endorsement today to House incumbent Kurt Schrader of Oregon, who's not necessarily a household name, but somebody who's facing a real challenge from the left. What do you make of it, Ouija? Well, I think that we should expect President Biden to be um, announcing more of these endorsements as we get closer um, to the midterm election. He has already been picking up his travel because he's made clear that he's you know, a little bit frustrated that he doesn't get enough credit where he believes credit is deserved for his accomplishments so far. He has said that publicly. Um, and so he wants to speak directly to the American people to make sure they understand, for example, the benefits of the American Rescue Plan um, or the uh, infrastructure law that Congress passed together. So these things are not unrelated to the midterm elections, right? Because, um, you know, for many people, they'll be voting on on him and his performance as well and you look at how much he has not been able to do even with the very slim uh, majority he currently has in in Congress and so you know you have to wonder how that will be impacted if they lose even more seats so this is very critical for President Biden and we expect that he'll be traveling even more especially to those areas where there all are vulnerable Democrats up for um, re-election so this is no surprise especially as we get even closer um, to November so I think that uh, we can expect him not only to talk more about candidates he wants to endorse but also to physically go and uh, support uh, his candidates, the you candidates just, that he wants to. You just feel it in the air. A busy and big political week's about to start. Weijia Zhang, yes. Nicole Killian, thank you both.